Well, our passage this evening is Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, which I think perhaps many of us could, could likely quote uh, without um, you know, looking at, at these pages. Um, but let me go ahead and read it. Um, again, this is somewhat of a turning point uh, in Paul's letter to the Romans. It's, it's actually a transition from the things that the Lord has done for us to the things now that we are to do uh, for Him. Uh, so it looks back, uh, it really wants us, Paul wants us to look back uh, at what's come before, at those mercies, so that we might do then what He's calling us to do, which He unpacks then in the chapters that actually follow. But let's, uh, let's go ahead and read it, and then we'll, uh, we'll take a look at, uh, at this. He says in chapter 12, verse 1, Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Now, again, my reason for choosing this particular text is uh, it, it gives us the opportunity to review a little bit of what we saw this morning, maybe go into that a little bit more. Also to remind us what it is that the Lord in His mercy has done for us, but also to encourage us um, to worship the Lord, not just as we gather on Sundays, but with the totality of our lives. Now, this morning uh, we were reminded that really the only reason that we're on the narrow path, uh, the only reason we even heard uh, the gospel in the first place entered through the only door, which is our Lord Jesus Christ, and are on that highway to heaven, the highway of holiness, is purely because of God's mercy. It's not because of anything that we did. God made sure the gospel would come to us. But he not only did that, he also gave us his Holy Spirit, as we were reminded this morning, to show us uh, the things we never would have seen uh, without him. Uh, we were on the broad road. Uh, we were on our way to hell. Uh, we were dead to the things of God and would have perished forever. That's what it means to be a natural man, but for the mercy of God. Now, Paul tells us in our passage this evening that this mercy actually calls for a response from us. The Lord didn't lift us out of this uh, miry pit, this bottomless pit, and clean us off and clothe us just to send us on our way. Tonight, we're going to, as I've said, enlarge a bit on what we saw this morning to remember again what it is that the Lord has done for us so that we will again be encouraged to do what he actually calls us to do for him, the reason why he actually reached down into the pit and saved us, it was that we might worship him. And again, we need to understand that, that worship is, is not just what we do here on Sunday, but worship means service, service to our God. And really, our whole lives are to be uh, an act of worship and service to him. So first of all, let's be reminded what the Lord has done for us. When Paul exhorts us uh, to worship the Lord, he does so on the basis of his loving kindness, which often in Scripture is, is in the plural, loving kindnesses, the mercies that he has shown us through his Son, the Lord Jesus. Notice again in verse 1, Paul says, therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Now, he puts this signpost here to get us to reflect back on the many things that he's already told us in this letter so that we might be encouraged to do what it is he's calling us to do. Now, one of the things, I'm just going to back up for a bit and just talk a little bit about the context of the, uh, of the book of Romans. One of the things that, that makes this letter unique among the letters that Paul has written is that this is Paul's explanation of the gospel. 
And he certainly touches on it in his other letters, but this is really an, an unfolding of that, uh, of that entire work of the Lord, showing us where we were and what it is that the Lord has, has done. Now, he wrote it to these believers in Rome, actually, when he was on his third missionary journey, and he did that for several reasons, not the least of which were these particular two reasons. The first was that he wanted prayer. Uh, Paul says in, later in the chapter that he had collected an offering from the Gentile churches for the poor saints who were in Jerusalem. He wanted these Roman believers to pray for him that the Lord would bless this offering. And really, he had three reasons why he wanted the Lord to, to bless it. First of all, he wanted the offering to meet the needs of, of these poor, suffering believers in Jerusalem. Now, we, we don't often uh, think about this, but um, we do need to remember that the Jews who were believers were being persecuted by their, their brothers, uh, by their kinsmen. You know, how many times they tried to get Paul, how many times they tried to kill Paul. It was difficult to be a Christian, and it was bringing a hardship on these believers. And so Paul gathered this collection in order to bring relief to them. So he was asking, first of all, for prayer that the Lord would bless that offering uh, to that end. Uh, secondly, he wanted this to basically be a display of love of the Gentile church uh, for their Jewish brethren. Uh, it was to be a display of love. I mean, when one part of the body suffers, uh, we, we all suffer. Uh, when there are believers that are suffering in other lands, we should be uh, thinking about them as though we are there with them and we are suffering along with them because they, again, are a part of the one body of Christ and they are our brothers and sisters in the Lord. And we are one day going to be spending, uh, really, eternity with them. So Paul wanted this to be a display of love, the Gentile believers for them. And thirdly, he did this to remind the Gentile believers uh, to help them realize just how indebted they actually are uh, to these Jewish believers for the privilege of sharing in their blessings. Remember, we saw this morning that the Messiah was sent to the Jews first to fulfill God's promises to them. It was their rejection of their Messiah and of the gospel that brought the riches of the gospel to these Gentiles in order to make the Jews jealous so that they too might receive Jesus and the blessings of eternal life in him. So it was meant to be a, an act of mercy to these Jewish believers. It was meant to be an act of love from the Gentile believers, but it was also meant to help the Gentile believers see how much they actually owed to these Jewish believers for the, the blessings that they had. Paul was asking for prayer that this sacrifice would essentially strengthen the unity of the whole church so that they might all know that they were one in Jesus. But that was the first reason that he was asking for prayer. The second reason was this, that as he delivered this offering, he realized he was going to be in danger, in the same danger the Jewish believers were in who were already there in Judea. And so he asked the Romans to pray for him that he might be delivered from the many enemies of the gospel who were there. In the letter, he expresses the hope that after he delivers this uh, offering uh, to, to the Jews, uh, that after he leaves Palestine, that he was, he was hoping to come to them, to the Romans, in order to be encouraged by their faith, to see the faith that they had in the Lord Jesus Christ and the love that they had, and to be refreshed by that, and also, of course, to encourage them by the faith that he had. And then he wanted to go to Spain, that he might preach the gospel there, where Jesus had not yet been named so that the Lord might gather more of his sheep uh, into his kingdom. Now, we know from the book of Acts that Paul's prayer, the prayer he was asking the Romans to offer for him, wasn't really answered, at least in the way that he had hoped it would be answered, because while he was in Jerusalem, his enemies did find him, and he was arrested, and he was examined and put on trial in many different uh, venues, and then he was sent to Rome uh, to stand before Caesar. So he was hoping to come to Rome in order to spend time with them, 
He actually did go to Rome, but it wasn't so much to spend time with them, although the believers who were there did come and visit him. Now, the Lord always answers our prayers, but he often answers them in ways that we don't necessarily expect. But let's not forget that his answers are always better than the things that we're actually asking for because when Paul was in Rome, he was not only able to encourage the believers who came and visited him while he was in prison, but he was also able to preach the gospel to Caesar's household and the whole Praetorian Guard actually came, came to know uh, the gospel through his stay there in Rome. So God had another plan. He planned for him to go to Rome, but not exactly as he had intended. So one of the reasons why Paul wrote the letter was to ask for prayer for these two things. But Paul had another reason for writing this letter. The church in Rome, remember, was not planted by the Apostle Paul, but it was planted by some Jewish converts who were saved in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, who had been discipled by the apostles. Remember, that's what the sale of all the properties was about, so they could keep everybody there and take care of them until they were able to be discipled. And then they returned home. And when these believers returned home, which in their case was Rome, they began to share the gospel with others and a church was planted. Now, Paul was writing this letter because he was concerned for them. He wanted to make sure that they were grounded in the truth. He wanted to make sure they understood the Lord's mercies and what His mercies actually called them to do. Now, since these mercies that He tells them about are, are also ours in the Lord Jesus Christ, and since uh, they call us to do the same thing that, uh, that they actually called them to do, uh, we should consider them uh, briefly. Now, again, this is kind of like reviewing the book of Romans, so we're not going to be able to look at everything. But it's a good way to kind of think about uh, where we were outside of the Lord Jesus, what our condition was when we were in a natural state, when we were on that broad road. Because if we don't understand that, if we don't see what we were apart from Jesus, we're really not going to be able to, to see the mercies of the Lord. Uh, J.C. Ryle wrote uh, in the book, uh, Christian Leaders of the 18th Century, that the Lord often sends revival uh, when society becomes very dark and very evil. Uh, he doesn't send light in the midst of a brilliant light that he's already shining because you can't see it very well, but you can see it very well with a dark backdrop. By the way, that's an encouragement to us that perhaps this nation is ripe for revival because things are getting morally, spiritually very dark so that if the Lord were to shine his light, it would be very, very conspicuous. Well, the same thing is true with regard to how we view the mercies of the Lord. We're not going to see how brightly they shine unless we first see how dark the background is in which the Lord shows us these mercies. So let's just look at a few of these things. Now, Paul in this letter, first of all, says, I think very obvious, that we were dead. That was our condition, dead, spiritually dead, judicially dead, and we were on our way to physical death. The worst by far is the judicial death. Adam's sin against God in the garden killed us in these three ways. Paul writes in Romans 5, verse 17, for if by the transgression of the one, and that is Adam, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. But notice the transgression of the one, through that death reigned through the one. Uh, Paul says in Ephesians 2, 1, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins. He goes on to say, we too, were, we were all dead. That's the way we came into the world because of the sin of Adam. Now what that means is, not only that we would die physically, remember what the Lord said to Adam and Eve in the garden, for you are dust, and to dust you will return, or you shall return. Uh, they were going to die physically, and their bodies were going to return to the ground. But this death it means not only that, the seeds of death were sown in our bodies, but that we would also have to face the consequences of Adam's sin and our sins in God's courts of law. This is what we mean by judicial death. Paul writes in Romans 
So then, as through one transgression there resulted condemnation to all men. We were all condemned by that sin, condemned to hell forever. And we died, thirdly, spiritually. Uh, Adam and Eve lost the spirit. They lost it for themselves. They lost it also for us. And because we no longer had the spirit, we no longer loved God, but hated God. God. I think we noted this morning, we hated what we saw of God in nature. You know, God reveals himself through the, the creation, but man suppresses that knowledge. We worked to cover over that revelation, and we said, where is God? We hated the fact that he was showing us that we were guilty. We don't like to live with guilt, so we worked to silence our consciences. We hated the fact that the God who exists in well, the God who exists, the God who shows us that he exists in creation is our creator and that we were bound to worship him. But we refused to do that. We refused to serve him. We refused to worship him. Paul writes in Romans 8, verses 7 and 8, we saw this this morning, because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. We should read here, those in this condition cannot worship God. We cannot we, because we hate him. We don't want to love him. We don't want to serve him. Uh, some have said, and I think it's altogether true, that I think uh, John Gerstner said this, and I think he was quoting Jonathan Edwards, that a uh, natural man, if he could, would drag God off the throne and would put him to death. And that's true. We know that's true. And why do we know that's true? because God came down and became a man. And his own people took him and handed him over to the Romans to be put to death. That's what man thinks about God, and that's what we thought about him. We didn't want to worship him. We wanted to kill him. And even though we knew that he was God and that he alone could do anything to save us or help us from the condemnation that our conscience was telling us that we were liable to, we refused to seek him again because we hated him. Paul writes in Romans 3.11, there is none who understands, there is none who seeks for God. And what he means by that is in their own power. People seek for the Lord, but that's only because of God's grace. So because of this, every day we were storing up wrath for the day of God's judgment. We don't have time to look at it here, but the Bible does teach that there are degrees of punishment. We were storing up wrath, which means we were doing the things which would bring more and more of God's wrath down upon us. And we would have received the full measure of his wrath for our sins. Paul writes in Romans 2, verses 5 and 6, again pointing uh, to the Jews. But because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God who will render to each person according to his deeds. Not just generally, not just life and death, but according to the individual things that they've actually done. And I'm, by the way, this, re this certainly applies not just to Jews, but also to Gentiles. It applied to all of us. That's what we would have received in that condition. And... We do need to bear in mind that there are people who are still in that condition and some who are going to remain that way throughout their entire lives and actually are going to receive these things on the day of judgment, which is why, of course, uh, Robert Murray McShane writes in, in his hymn, you know, when I see the, the wicked call on the rocks and hills to fall, when I see them start and shrink on the fiery deluge brink, then, O oh Lord, that I will know just how much I, basically how much I owe we don't really know how much we owe the Lord until we see what it is we deserve, until we see the consequences of what we've done. But we deserve to be thrown into that lake along with everybody else. That's the dark background, but in his mercy, God intervened. While we were still enemies, while we were still hard in our hearts and hating God, he sent his son to take our sins and the judgment that was due on us upon himself and he died in our place. Romans 5, verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Remember, um, uh, Sinclair Ferguson referred to this verse 
saying we don't have to prepare ourselves for the grace of God. God sent his son while we were still sinners. And then he goes on to say in verse 10, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So the love that God shows, he shows toward us while we're sinners, while we're still enemies, he reconciles us to him through the death of his son. Through the death of Jesus and his subsequent resurrection, we were raised again to newness of life. Romans 6, verse 4. Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death. That baptism is the baptism of the Spirit, not the water baptism. When we were put in Christ, then we died with him, and when he was raised, we were raised with him. So that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. Through this work, he's changed our nature. Through his obedience... We were justified. Uh, Romans 5, verse 19. For as through the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, even so through the obedience of the one, the many will be made righteous. We are righteous in Jesus. That's the basis of our justification and our acceptance by God. That's why we're going to go to heaven. And even though in, in this redeemed, justified state, Paul tells us in Romans chapter 7, we still struggle with sin, our sins will no longer condemn us, Romans 8, verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And though our bodies are still going to die, even though the, the seeds of, of death are still sown in them and they will return to the dust, they will be raised when Jesus comes again and they will be glorified. Paul writes in Romans 8, verses 22 through 23, For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And not only this, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. We know that that's what the Lord has in store for us. The Spirit of God is showing us that that's what he has in store. The Spirit of God is giving us the desire for that. And that is going to take place one day. Uh, if we happen to be alive when the Lord comes, he's going to change us and they'll be redeemed then. We'll have our resurrection bodies then. But if we have to die and return to the dust while our soul goes to be with the Lord in heaven, he will raise that body and he will reunite it with our soul and he will change it into the image of Jesus. Now Paul tells us that there is nothing in heaven or earth that can ever possibly separate us from his love in the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 8, verses 38 through 39. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor principalities, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus Christ. Our Lord, nothing can take us away from him. Jesus said in uh, the Good Shepherd discourse, I give eternal life to them and they will never perish and no one can snatch them from my hand. He says further, we will be glorified with him in heaven. If nothing's going to take us away from the love of Christ, that means that his purpose is going to be fulfilled in us and we are going to make it. Uh, Romans 8 verses 29 through 30. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these he, whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. We will be glorified. And we do need to remember that the Lord did all this for us, while we were still his enemies, we did not choose him, but he chose us. And he chose us, and this is the greatest mercy of all. In his mercy, he chose to show us his mercy. This was his choice. This was what he desired. Notice again in Romans chapter 9, verses 15 through 18. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. Compassion. 
So then it does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I raised you up to demonstrate my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. So then he has mercy on whom he desires and he hardens whom he desires. Pharaoh is one of the ones he hardened. But by his grace, we are those that he has had mercy upon for trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. So we were lost without hope, on our way to everlasting destruction, wanted nothing to do with God, were not seeking God, would have gone into hell forever. But the Lord had mercy on us. Now that's what Paul was actually pointing, pointing us back to in, in verse 1 as to why we should worship the Lord. So let's just consider briefly how we are to worship Him, and certainly the whole Bible is full of how we are to worship the Lord. So how would we summarize this? Well, we can do it perhaps in, in a simple way. But the question is, what are we to give the Lord in return for all of these mercies? Is what He wants, is all He wants, an hour or two, once a week, uh, gathering together to worship Him? Well, obviously, He wants more than that. He tells us He wants everything. He wants all that we have. Again, Romans 12, verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Now, notice this is how we are to worship the Lord. This is the service He wants us to give Him. He wants us to worship Him. He wants us to live for Him. He wants us to serve Him. But, but how? Well, He wants us, essentially by what He's saying here, He wants us to do it in the same way that Jesus did. We just read a few moments ago that we have been predestined to become conformed to His image. Now, that doesn't just mean in heaven. That means on earth. That means that we are to be becoming like Him. That's why the Father sent Jesus into the world, was that He might redeem a people that would be His own possession and that He might actually be the firstborn among many brethren. This is why He gave us the Holy Spirit, was so that we might be made like the Lord Jesus. This is why we have all these commands in Scripture, put off the flesh, make no provision for the flesh, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ, put your sins to death, but yield to the Spirit of God, okay, is because this is what He wants to accomplish in us, the image of Jesus. He wants us to worship Him the way that Jesus worshiped Him. Now, Jesus worshiped His Father. He served His Father with His whole being, with His whole life. He didn't hold anything back. Jesus loved Him with His whole heart. He honored Him with all of His thoughts, with His whole mind. He committed his whole soul to him, to his service, and he gave him all the strength that he possessed. The Lord Jesus used every gift and every grace to honor his Father, even in the most difficult circumstances, and he did it without complaining. Jesus served him his entire life, from the time that he was conceived in the womb to the time he laid down his life on the cross, from the time he was, well, even in the time when he was in the grave, his soul was with the Lord, still honoring Him, still serving Him. And from the time He was raised, the time He was, you know, ascended into heaven, the time He has been ruling, to the present time and even to the distant future, the Lord Jesus is going to serve His Father. We're talking about the man, Christ Jesus, okay, uh, who is divine person in our nature. He gave Himself to the Father entirely, and He will do so forever. That's what the Lord wants us to do. Paul tells us that the worship that we owe God goes beyond our meeting with Him on the Lord's Day. It certainly includes that because we are gathered here, as we mentioned this morning, to worship Him. You know, not just to, not just to hear a sermon because you can hear a sermon anywhere. You know, you can hear it any time. You can listen to them all day long if you want to, you know, MP3s and on the radio and so forth. It's not that God just wants us to hear a sermon. He wants us to worship Him. A sermon is only a part of that. 
So that's what we're doing here, but we need to realize that worship goes far beyond that, and we are to serve Him and worship Him with all that we have, with our whole lives all the time, in the same way that Jesus did, wherever we are. Now, if we are to do this successfully, Paul goes on to say we have to be able to break free from the other influences that are vying for our attention, the world's influences that are continually going to tempt us and hold us back. Paul continues in verse 2, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Now, why is it that we need to have our, uh, our minds, as it were, transformed? Uh, or why is it that our minds need to be changed? Well, it's because we were on the broad road. Uh, we were walking according to the prince of the power of the air. Um, the Lord typically saves us after we've been in the world for a few years. And our minds have had a chance to be bent in the direction of the world. I mean, tell me if that isn't all of our experiences here. Now, when the Lord saves us, He changes the direction of our hearts, although we still have that struggle within us. But it takes time for that to work itself out in our thoughts. We have to sift through what it is we think, what it is we believe, what we see as right and wrong. It takes a while to, to sift through those things. As a matter of fact, the Scripture talks about those who are more mature in the Lord have their senses trained to discern between good and evil. Not everybody is going to know it right away. We certainly didn't know it right away. That's why we need to sift through what it is we're thinking, what it is we believe, what we think is right and wrong. We need to take all of those thoughts and all of those desires to the Word of God and examine them in the light of that Word. That's how we transform our thinking so that our lives will also be transformed. We need to reject the bad, put, put off uh, the sin, put it to death, make no provision for it. And we need to put on the good. We need to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what needs to take place if we are to be transformed into his image. So this is what Paul, by the Holy Spirit, commands us to do. This is what God's mercies certainly deserve. I mean, what can I render to the Lord for all of his benefits towards me? The psalmist acts. I will lift up the, the cup of salvation. I will call upon the name of the Lord. May it be in the presence of all his people. I will pay my vows to the Lord. That's what the Lord's mercies deserve. This is why the Lord gave us his Holy Spirit, was so that we might become like him and that we might worship Him. So again, as we think about why we should do this, I mean, it, it's really, it's, it's what's behind everything that the Lord has done for us. It's His plan, it's His purpose for us to make us like the Lord Jesus. And so, again, the Lord, through the Apostle Paul, by the Holy Spirit, urges us this evening to present our bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to Him. What does God want as far as our worship? This is what he wants. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And, and let's ask the Lord to give us the grace to, to give him that.